used to living in a sort of televised environment in which contradictions don't bother us as much as they used to. They just make us twinge. In other words, we'll see a huge picture of rubble on TV and a spokesman will be saying, there was no rubble, and the rubble's behind you. And, and we're used to that now. And we're, you know, we've lived through periods where Richard Nixon would come on TV and say, I am not a liar. And his eyes would drift off, you know. And so we're more used to contradiction than they were and take it less seriously. We expect it. In fact, certain uh, uh, cultural artifacts of our period, like Twin Peaks, make a joke out of our ability to accept contradiction. They use it in a way as a kind of irony on our society that we can accept it with, with very little difficulty. But this wasn't true in this period, so it was an important criticism if Marx could show that the imperatives of the economy to accumulate human labor, which for Marx was the key to capital, not accumulating money, because money was a medium, right, that was used to accumulate living labor. That's what is the, the fundamental meaning of the alienation of labor for Marx. To put it in, its, in, in really basic terms, it's this. The secret to capitalism is moving from a society, and this is why it has ethical implications that I'd like to draw, moving in a society where the question is, what are you to a society in, in, the, in which the question is, what do you own or have? What do you do in the sense of a career, a job, or whatever? Once human beings are redescribed in that way, they're redescribed in terms of their work time, which is not voluntary. I mean, you know, Reagan recognizes that, right? He distinguishes voluntarism from work. He's that smart. And we all know when we're at work, we're not voluntary. And one way you can know, no matter how much you love your job, everybody always tells me I love my job, that very few people, when they're given two months off at full pay, decide to come in every day and work their butt off. It's just, we Americans may love their jobs, but they may also have deep psychological reasons to believe that compensatory thing, namely that they do really love it. They may, in fact, be uh, devious in some respect. It's deeper than a conscious one. That which we'll discuss when we get to Freud. So for Marx, the crime, as it were, that capital commits, and it's not a, it, I shouldn't even use the word crime, because it's purely systemic and it has dual effects, one of which is incredibly positive. The negative effect it has is to reduce the rich amount of human needs to needs that can simply be bought and sold on a marketplace. In other words, to make us understand our needs in terms of marketable needs. And this is, this is almost a boring lecture now because our need for love, compassion, understanding, for social relations, and so many other needs now are all merchandisable. I mean, even if you, even, the, the, one of the kinkiest things people used to do, which is to have intimate sexual conversations with one another, now that's telephonized and you put it on your visa, right? I mean, th just think of that one example about telephone sex. This is how far capitalism can go in rationalizing what at one time was an, a very intimate personal exchange without the mediation of money into one that becomes marketable. So if you're watching USA on television late at night, which I sometimes do, it's got all those stupid B-movies on it, then here come on a, a whole stream of lovely young men and women saying, call me up, $5 a minute. So if you're lonely, sad, tired, want a friend, there's one on the market. That's the way in which Marx saw relations, as it were, between things, because commodities are things, even when it's us. You know, if you're in a room full of people who sell insurance and you're trying to hire one of them and you're the executive, you're choosing between commodities. Now, someone will immediately object, of course, one of the people there uh, may have a better personality, great. That means that that's a feature of that commodity that's attractive to you as a buyer. That's why, that's why the person may get the job. So for Marx, that was the violence it committed, was it not only commodified our relations, but our lives, and, and put the pursuit of things in the, in the place of a whole host, and he, I mean, in, in place of a whole host of other needs, desires, in fact, the desire just for social relations themselves, which today is, is a real desire. 
just the desire for a genuine social relation or two, one or two genuine social relations. So now the, 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 that was the bad part on the social relations side for Marx. That's where capitalism was at loggerheads with the great ideals of freedom and so on is because such human beings under such an economic system because of competition with one another for what jobs were available in order to survive within such an economy where, the, where working could only be called free labor as a kind of a joke. In other words, that whether we work or not, whether we make that as a choice is sort of a joke, right? Well, I can choose not to work. Well, the streets last night as this city froze were full of people who I'm sure many didn't choose not to work, right? I, I doubt that a lot of them are lazy. Like Jesse Jackson, I don't think that that's the problem with poor people, is that they're lazy. But in any case, if you choose not to work, uh, you, you may very well find yourself un under a bridge at night. One way you can find out, by the way, and this is simple to cut through a lot of the crap you usually hear about class analysis and there are no, there are no classes in America. Here's a little empirical test for, uh, for the audience to try. Don't work for eight years. Stop working. And if really bad things happen to you, you were in the working class. If at the, end of the, at the end of the eight years everything's fine and dandy, you still got a house and a car and a nice place to live and a lot of nice friends, then you were okay. Otherwise, you were in the working class. But if you stop working for that long and you're in deep trouble, you were a, you were a worker and didn't know it. That's a nice empirical test, and I challenge any of you to try it. Someone who denies that there are classes can always give this one a shot. It's a, it's a way to find out if there are, really find out. So those are some of the downsides. Classes are produced with unequal power. Uh, social relations become, as it were, reified, frozen, phony, if you will. The upside is the upside that uh, where Marx, I think, praises uh, capitalism in terms beyond those ever used by William Buckley as a system that had produced from nature more wonders, more technological wonders than the whole previous history of the world had seen. In other words, the good things capitalism did was to build railways, medicines, and even more importantly, new needs. See, many of you may think that all this sort of negative talk's kind of old left wing, all whining after Bush. We shouldn't whine like that. We should be really happy about it. You know, a thousand points of light, that vision thing. But uh, the upside of this is that new needs get produced. And for Marx, that was a revolutionary process because the system would never, as, as productive as it is, there'd be no way it could ever catch up to the level of need produced by it. Have you ever noticed that? Now think about, here's another example to think about, please. Uh, remember how good stereo sounded when you first got it instead of mono? You know, mono just played as oh, one sort of flat music. And, Mono sounded okay when you first got it because it was better than that scratchy thing that, like this. And you got your first stereo and it was so exciting and nobody even mentioned that the tapes you played on your stereo had a little hiss in them. But now to just put a tape in something, you hear that hiss and you think about your friends that have a CD and they don't have that hiss. So there's a new need now for hissless music all around music, a whole new need. Now, apologists for the system want to say, well, that need, you know, we didn't create that need. Well, that seems highly dubious. Think of commodities like the hula hoop. Does anyone remember the great hula hoop movement in the United States where people went around demanding hula hoops and then the capitalists went, we'll make them for you. <laughs> well, no, no, that movement didn't occur, see. I mean, there was no social movement called the hula hoop movement who went around, hula hoops are death, hula hoops are death. No, some, some jack leg went, you know, I'll bet you if we make these things like this, put out a few records, people will be sweating. And the next thing you know, people needed them. And you just have to be nostalgic not to say they needed them. I mean, I heard someone the other day in the, in the video store going, I need this VCR. And it was just as dramatic a statement for that person as someone in one of the third world countries that we plunder 
saying, I need rice. I mean, it's, it's a new need. So capitalism's upside is it creates vast new technological abilities which extend the power of the human species. Extended until we can like to, you know, go to the moon, build a CD that doesn't hiss and so on. That's the upside.